Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Wendy, and uh, welcome to Innovation and Progress in Concentrating Solar Power. It's our Actera public lecture series, and it's the third lecture of the series on what's next for the clean energy grid. And today, May 18th, we're going to hear from Steve Anglin from We Solar CSP. We're really excited to hear his global perspective on uh, renewable energy technology and all the good that it can do in helping us combat our giant climate challenges. So I'm going to start us off with a little overview of Actera, if you're not familiar with us. We're an environmental nonprofit, and we've been around since 1970, serving the San Francisco Bay Area. We're based in Palo Alto, California, and our mission is bringing people together to create local solutions for a healthy planet. And right now, our focus is on the most urgent issue of our time, which is climate change. Uh, we have an approach where we encourage people to make individual actions and make decisions uh, and behavior changes that will help reduce their carbon footprints, but we're also aware that we can spur broader action through things like policy advocacy and working with local governments and businesses and other institutions to make this change even bigger. You can find us online at actera.org and also on the social media networks shown there. So a little bit more about how we are combating the climate crisis. We have some different pillars that we focus on through our work. Uh, the first of these is beneficial electrification for all. And this is for electrification of homes and buildings, as well as transportation like EVs. We also have a pillar on food and climate change, which is about reducing our food waste and also uh, promoting plant forward diets. We have a pillar on education and youth where we work with high schoolers as well as college students and middle schoolers um, to promote different curriculum uh, that fills the gap for this in different middle schools. And also we work with youth to improve their advocacy skills. And that leads me also to the fourth pillar, advocacy. We have several different coalitions that Actera leads, including one on EV charging for all, and another one called Homegrown Bay Area, which focuses on just sustainable local food system. And to focus more on our education pillar, we of course have uh, this event today, which is part of the public lecture series. And as I was mentioning, we have a focus on youth. Um, this program is called Youth Be the Change, and it's giving middle school students and teachers access to information on climate change basics like science, um, as well as the solutions to climate change. And then our Actera Student Ambassadors Program works with high schoolers and college students to um, help them with things like learning how to make public comments and also uh, teaching them sort of from various experts in the field um, what skills they need to know to be better grassroots advocates. The public lecture series, um, what we're here for today, invites different experts from different fields, um, such as business, um, non other nonprofits, um, even government, to speak on their areas of expertise and uh, cover various approaches to global climate change problems and solutions. Uh, we have lots of events that we'd love for you to be a part of, so you can find them at actera.org slash events. One of the things that's coming up soon, um, May 25th, is a virtual induction cooking class. Um, we're going to be making tacos and mojitos with Chef Kelvin. These recipes are always 100% plant-based, which is really great, and you get to learn a little bit about induction cooking and its benefits. Uh, we also have an exciting event coming up on June 8th. We just launched this on Eventbrite. It's called Planning for Electrification. It's part of our Green at Home workshop series, June 8th, uh, 6 p.m. And we'll be hearing from Tom Cabot, who has a great um, background in how to electrify your home. And he'll be looking in all the ins and outs and things you need to know when you're thinking about doing this. Um, and we hope that you'll also subscribe to our newsletter at actera.org slash subscribe. Thank you so much to our series underwriters. We couldn't do this work without their support. Mary and Clinton Gilliland, and also Armand and Elian Nukermans. Thank you so much. We also have some sponsors and partners to thank. Uh, we have the Bay Area Air Quality Management District. Thank you so much for your sponsorship. And we have partners including the Foster and Green Team Network. As always, we appreciate your support to help us keep these events free. If you've already donated, we appreciate it so much. Thank you. 
And if you haven't yet donated, you can visit our website at actera.org slash donate now. Uh, also, we have the other two events in the series online in video form if you missed them. So please check out actera.org slash lectures. So it's my great pleasure to welcome Steve Anglin. He is the CEO and founder of We Solar CSP Inc. It's a minority owned American renewable energy company that designs and constructs modular solar microgrids. Steve has been the CEO of We Solar for six years and is engaged with industrial companies and municipalities where We Solar brings a wide range of capabilities, including long duration energy storage, solar industrial process heat, production of green hydrogen, and water desalination. Steve's mission is to significantly reduce the global carbon footprint of industry and to propel the affordability and accessibility of sustainable. Wendy, thank you for your uh, great uh, overview of Actera. The, the one thing I saw on that those slides was the food. Um, for the last two years, I've gone green with my food, and uh, I don't eat meat, at least I try not to. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so that's a, I, I love what you guys are doing. I think that you are squarely on point with what you're uh, achieving. I'd definitely like to sit in on that session on green in your house. I mean, I've got solar panels, but I'm sure there's more I can do. Um, okay, so I'm gonna share my screen and thank you for everyone for joining this um, this session. It's, I, I hope, hopefully, we have a lot of questions. I'm going to share a few slides uh, about the company, the technology, what we do here. We sold CSP, but the the real purpose of the, of this discussion is to sort of talk about CSP at, from a more holistic perspective and give you a better sense of, you know, why is it so important today uh, when we look at um, these uh, thresholds and um, mandates that we have to hit as far as 2% uh, increase in Celsius. All right, perfect. So um, I'd like to start by just giving you a little bit of an overview of what you're going to take a look at. The, um, the technology that we use uh, at We Solar CSP is something called the ASC. It was invented by um, a young man. His name is uh, Ayman Almata, Professor Ayman Almata. He's a Fulbright scholar. He is from, he's Jordanian um, and he built the technology and we've collaborated together with that tech. He's our CTO of our company and he is a, a genius, <laughs> if you want to put it like that. And the technology is disruptive. It's actually getting a lot of accolades um, and we expect to be doing some wonderful things in the near future. So I'll start by saying that, and you can actually see it in this picture here. I don't know if you can see my cursor, but I'm circling it. This is the actual ASC technology. Yeah, we can see your cursor, thanks. Perfect. So, you know, when you think about um, renewable energy, you know, most people think in America, we're thinking about photovoltaics, right? We think about PV, PV farms, they're in the, the carports and, you know, rooftops for corporates and people's homes, right? Uh, the other type of uh, uh, renewable solar energy is uh, concentrated solar power. And what most people um, think of is the power towers. And then there's a picture of one there. So the, the combination of the two is when you get the ASC. So the CSP is thermal, it's thermal heat. Uh, and that's the same type of heat that we use today to, to generate electricity. So we have coal-fired power plants, oil, gas, and nuclear, all of them produce heat or thermal heat that we convert into electricity. So the, the issue there is that CSP takes up a lot of space. It's a, it's, it's a land hog, uh, but it does work and it has storage so it can do you know, up to 10, 12, 24 hours of storage. On the other side of the equation, you have PV, which is an acronym or the letters for photovoltaic which just means solar panels, right? And we're familiar with those. Um, the beauty of a solar panel is it's dirt cheap and you can actually put it anywhere, right? You can have two panels on your roof, you can put them, it's uh, distributive. That's the purpose of PV, um, but it doesn't work at night. 
right? And uh, in order for it to work, there's gallery. So the ASC technology combines the distributive nature of PV and the thermal heat and all the different applications of CSP. So I'm gonna run through some of these slides. I'm not gonna take a long time because I'd like to get to the conversation. There are, um, so when you think of concentrated solar power, there's many types of concentrated solar power, heliostat, power towers, parabolic trough, parabolic dish, and linear Fresnel. Um, these have been around for many, many years in the, in the mid 2000s, this technology has been around. Um, so I'd like to start with it just uh, to give you guys an idea of our tech, and then we can talk broadly about what's happening today in the world of concentrated solar power in America, in the USA. So this video will just basically show you how our technology works. The design, which I'm on put together, uses mathematical formulas to with these conical rings to concentrate the light of the sun into a fixed focal point. That focal point heats up to, and we just recently got tested, up to 1,500 degrees Celsius. Under that point is a, um, uh, where we store, actually have storage and uh, our heat transfer fluids. And they go in there and they heat up and they stay hot for a very long time. So it can be, various types of heat transfer fluids. It doesn't have to be just, um, I'll show you again. It doesn't have to be just, uh, you know, molten salt. We can use rocks, basalt, ceramics, and things of that nature to heat up. And then depending on the off-taker and what they're looking for, um, you know, and we, we can talk about off-takers, whether it's Procter & Gamble, Mars, you know, Colgate, Kimberly Mills, whatever the off-taker needs, that's the temperature we need to get to, whether it's electricity or just industrial process heat. So as you can see here, there's an actual picture of the, 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 the facility that we've actually built. Um, and these are some of the folks that have actually vetted the technology around the world. Some of these companies you're probably familiar with. Um, and NREL is also one of them at the very bottom here, at the Department of Energy National Lab. So, you know, one of the big areas of concentrated solar power that makes it really interesting is the concept of thermal storage or thermal energy storage. And I always call it long duration energy storage because we can go longer than 12 hours, 10 to 12 hours. So how do you do that, right? You know, that's intermittency of electricity or intermittency of renewables. Uh, that's a really big problem that the world is trying to solve. So how we do it is through, um, you know, my CTO, Ayman, always says, it makes me laugh. He goes, if you want to make something dirt cheap, make it out of dirt, right? And literally, we can use rocks, basalts, ceramics, um, mineral oil, water, you know, molten salt. You know, there are companies that only do this. They only focus on thermal storage in, in Australia, in Italy, around the world. And some of these companies, all they do is they just take rocks, they put aluminum in the rock and they heat up the rock. It stays hot for very, very long, many, many hours. And then at night, you can flow through cold air to push up the hot air to heat up water. Or if you're looking for a solar industrial process heat, you can just push the air out, and you can use that heat in the application of what you're trying to make. So this is not disruptive, but it's it's clever. It's very smart, and it's very affordable, right? So it, it brings down the cost of whatever process. It could be electricity, it could be heat, it could be water desalination, it could be a lot of different things that makes it more uh, uh, affordable for the client and ultimately for the for the consumer. So this slide just shows you the process of how our technology works, heats up the transfer fluid and then pushes it through to steam, through, through the steam turbine. I'm not gonna talk too much about the cost because I think that when, I, when we talk about cost, you know, there's this thing called the peaker moments and, and, and electricity is one of the things that really does get more expensive 
when the sun goes down, when the dusk, everyone flips on the lights, they start to use their washers and dryers and their ironing and all the cooking, the cost of electricity goes up. Now, the, the base load can't take all that. So it goes down, the base is like, uh, and then peaker plants kick on. You know, it could be diesel, gas, nuclear, whatever. They kick on to capture that demand, right? So the cost of that electricity is actually really expensive. Um, and if you have a solar farm, the, they don't work at night, right? So you need batteries, lithium ion batteries. And these batteries are very expensive. The levelized cost of electricity is really high. I won't throw numbers out because I think that that's a little bit, if I throw out numbers, I think that, you know, we can get into debates, but I can tell you that our cost of electricity is a lot lower for the peak of moments, oh, a significant amount. Now I'll give you a range. So from, you know, there, it can be up to $200 to $350 per kilowatt hour and as low as $30 to $35 per kilowatt hour. So that's the range. Um, and that's a big significant difference for the cost of storage. Um, I added a slide here just to kind of give you a better sense of what it actually looks like, the tech. So when we do, when we say build a project or a solar power plant or a microgrid, um, it looks something like this, right? So just to give you, if you look at the top picture, uh, these are the ASCs and, and six of these are equivalent to half, half a megawatt. So 12 will give you one megawatt, right? So we call these things clusters or you can call them a pod. But the idea is that, you know, it, it, the big idea that you should be getting from this is that it takes up a lot less land than uh, the, the equivalent solar farm. So if you think, and I say solar as in PV. So PV is really good. It's, you know, no one's knocking it. It's cheap. We're going to be using it for in the future for a long time. But the only issue with that, it takes up a lot of land, right? If you have a, a, a one megawatt, uh, PV farm, it takes up, I don't know, three, three acres, five acres, something like that. So we can do one megawatt for about one and a half to two acres, right? So that's a, a significant difference. And land is a scarce resource, especially when you're looking to be off grid or 24 hours a day, you know, you need, you need to be um, very concerned about how much land does it take up. And the, the distributive nature of that is where we win again. So, and if you look at the bottom picture, you can see how we link them together. And then this is right here is a storage unit. Um, and that's about the size of a shipping container. And that's where we hold the heat, uh, the storage fluids uh, or heat transfer medium. It could be a solid as well. So this is, this is the storage and this is how we do it another picture of our location. So one of the other thing about concentrated solar power that, you know, is really makes a lot of sense to me is, and I think this is where I was going initially with this company in the early days, is to hybridize um, the coal-fired power plants, right? So you've got a coal-fired power plant or even a gas-fired combined cycle power plant. That's, we're burning fossil fuels, we're burning dinosaurs, right? Um, they produce a lot of hydrocarbons, they produce a lot of uh, socks and NOx and carbon and all the stuff that we don't like. So the idea was to, to co-locate and basically hybridize our clean steam from the ASCs into their dirty steam where they're burning coal. And you know, over time, you know, what would happen is you, you know, turn this uh, coal fire plant into sort of a renewable energy. Uh, plant or a car note battery or something like that. That's, um, you know, one in the initial case, we're reducing the amount of coal that they're burning by about 30, 30 to 35%. So that's a very affordable way to decarbonize existing coal fired power plants, right? They're, they're, you know, they are, they're, most of them are being shut down, right? The, the idea is to shut them down, but I think 
we can use that infrastructure and we can make it, you know, keep the jobs, make it clean and sustainable and, and green uh, at the same time. Now that's just an idea, but, but that's one of the ideas you can do that with CSP because we produce thermal heat. Um, another, uh, this one is a, actually very recent. Um, Ayman and, and some other professors uh, wrote a white paper on splitting uh, thermal chemical splitting of water using thermal heat through the ASC. And the concept here, you know, I think there's different colors for how you produce hydrogen, like there's white, there's brown, there's gray, there's blue and pink, which is done by nuclear. But this one is actually called, I would say turquoise hydrogen, where we're heating up the water uh, to the point where it gets so hot that we can actually break the bond between the molecule, water molecule, and, and get the oxygen and hydrogen and actually siphon off the hydrogen. Right? That's a, a much more affordable way than power and electrolyzers. I had a conversation recently in Seattle with um, a very big company that they said to me, blue hydrogen is actually cheaper than green. And blue hydrogen is when you, you make hydrogen today and it's done through this process called steam methane reformin. The Haber-Bosch process is what it's actually called. And that is, um, you, you, you kind of just burn a fossil fuel to create electricity to power something called an electrolyzer with a, ca a cathode and anode. And they both, they go into the water and then they basically use a film and they, they separate the oxygen from the hydrogen. The electrolyzer is really expensive. So that idea of green hydrogen is um, a very expensive uh, process. Now, obviously if you put policy in place and you look at the IRA and how there's a lot of funding and money uh, written into that to make this cheaper, then it becomes uh, economically sensible, right? Uh, but, but we can do it in a, in a very affordable way just by heating up the, the molecules and then separating it that way. And, and there's an entire white paper that is written on this. So it's not just me talking. And uh, so I can attach that and or send it to Wendy and she can share it. Um, you know, after this, uh, this, uh, this session. It's pretty cool stuff. The first day, there were 15,000 views on this white paper on, in the first day. Um, okay, so some of this stuff, you, most of you probably already understand and know. When I, I already mentioned about base load and peak shaven. Um, so base load is just, you know, the, the grid. You know, everybody needs electricity, right? But during certain parts of the day, it gets expensive and the demand is higher in the morning and higher at the evening when the sun starts to go down. So that's the problem in this country, in every country when it comes to, because the sun doesn't stay up all the time, is to cover that demand. Um, there's something called the duck curve. Everyone's familiar. Well, if you're not familiar with the duck curve, uh, it's um, basically just showing you the demand in the morning and throughout the day. This period right here in the middle, is called curtailment, where, where we don't need that much electricity because, but that's the highest point where the sun is shining and we can, put, there's a lot of electricity produced, but it's not being used. It's called curtailment. However, there's a lot of technology, a lot of companies are looking how they can store this. Um, and hydrogen is one of the ways you can do it, but there's a lot of ways to store this electricity. We do it through our thermal process where we store the electricity during the day and then we use it when the demand is really high in the evening. So just a little explanation of the duck curve. And then obviously this is the same, just a different rendition where we store it during the day and we use it in the evening, the stored electricity, stored energy that we convert into electricity, or it could be industrial process heat if it's for in industry. And when I say industry, what I'm referring to is, you know, industrial, solar industrial process heat, if you think about it, things like glass, cement, concrete, aluminum, iron, steel, all these things that are made that we use, plastics, they're all burning something. We're burning stuff to get these products made, right? So, um, 
you know, the when you start to talk about how do we solve this problem, it's solved through, um, I think, concentrated solar power, right? There's a lot of other technologies out there, but let's look at the world now. Let's not just look at the US, right? If you look at China, if you look at Israel, if you look at Australia, look at Spain, all these countries are doing CSP and they're doing it really well. Um, and, you know, you can do a lot of things. Now, China does is the largest producer of coal fired power plants, but they're also the largest producer of renewable energy in the world, right? And we're catching up. I think that CSP in this country was um, frowned upon uh, in 2010. I think Ivan Parr was a little bit of a hiccup. Solana, there's a couple of plants, there's quite a few uh, CSP plants, the parabolic trough, it works, but it's first generation. Second generation is definitely um, power tower. And uh, you know, if you're in California, you probably know about Ivan Pa. Uh, it was I don't know, $2 billion or something like that. It was very expensive, very expensive in 2010. Um, there was no storage. The uh, levelized cost of electricity was really high. The um the, there was uh it was basically a jobs program right but the pv came in at around about the same time pv's cost came, went down and then they basically won all those companies kind of left the us and went somewhere else australia china places like this israel so now you know we looked at that business model we looked at it and said hey how can we do this better right so i think that's where we are with our technology. Um, this next slide is actually just a, a little bit of a schematic to give you an idea of what a solar plant would look like of we solar ASC power plant, what would it look like? So what you have here, one of the things that's actually quite, quite amusing to me is there's a guy on our team and he always says, we don't need contiguous land and that's really true. So when you think about a lot of times when you do a solar farm, you actually need um, contiguous land, which means, you know, you gotta wipe out the area, you know, you're putting down concrete and things like this. And it actually does affect the, um, it does affect the, you know, the, the environment. And we really don't wanna do that. So this is a good idea of what it looks like. Um, and then the other concept that I'd like to share with you is, you know, microgrids. And, you know, what, what comes to mind is uh, Puerto Rico. About a year ago, or maybe two years ago, I was in Puerto Rico to basically, um, you know, it was right after Irma and Maria, and maybe a year after that was the pandemic. So when those hurricanes hit Puerto Rico or any islands or coastal regions of America, you know, there's a lot of damage done. They always lose, always lose power, right? So with Puerto Rico, the, the idea is, you know, we want to be off the grid. We want to be, you know, our grid is not very good. We want to be um, independent of the grid. And so I went to at least nine cities and towns and I met with all the mayors. And I think there was a, a big idea for them to um, use something that could withstand the weather. Right, and even earthquakes, they have earthquakes in the southern region of the country, of the territory. So, you know, th this is where we, we were having great conversations. And with a microgrid, um, we can, you know, we use the ASC, we can use PV as well for the daytime because it's very cheap. We use the ASC for the peaker moments. We can even have other forms of backup as well, batteries or diesel even, you know, if it's required, right? But this way you can, and when the hurricane hits these parts of the country, right, it doesn't have to be Puerto Rico, but even the Caribbean and other places, the hospitals, the police station, the fire station, you know, the schools, it really does have an effect and, you know, people, people die. So this is very, very real. And I think that, you know, there's a, there's a lot of intent to get something done. The first time I heard about a virtual power plant was in Puerto Rico a couple of years ago with uh, Jigga Shah and team. So I think there's a lot of, uh, I think virtual power plants are a brilliant idea. Um, this, this just shows you 
the concept of uh, thermal energy, right? So typically with a coal-fired power plant or gas-fired power plant, they generate heat that heats up water, that creates steam, that turns a turbine. That turbine is made by Mitsubishi, Siemens, or GE, and that produces electricity. But if you were to scale it down to a for microgrid, you wouldn't use a GE turbine, right? It's too big. So you need something like a Stirling engine, something a little bit smaller if you want to produce electricity. Again, I think the lowest hanging fruit for this technology is in industry where we can produce heat to make things like steel, glass, fiberglass, where there's a need for heat. And these companies have huge carbon footprints. Like this one company has a carbon footprint the size of Panama and they want to reduce that. And even if it's slightly reduce it by 20% or something, we can help in that, that idea of reducing the footprint. These are some more pictures of the, of the plant that we have in um, Abu Dhabi. The plant is in Abu Dhabi, by the way, UAE. And the reason why that's interesting is because COP28 is gonna be in Dubai uh, this, I think December this year, December the COP28. So that's something where uh, my, uh, CTO, co-founder is uh, going to be there. I will be there. We're going to be, there are going to be a lot of eyes looking at our technology. The Middle East, North Africa, I think is one of the foremost uh, cutting edge areas of the world when it comes to renewables, believe it or not. I mean, I'll tell, I tell the story all the time. There's a section of uh, Saudi Arabia, which is the largest you know, the company there, Saudi Ramco, the largest producers of oil in the world, right? The company is huge and they produce a lot of oil. They are putting a section of land the size of Belgium to produce green hydrogen, right? So what does that say? It means that they're saying the future is gonna be green hydrogen and not oil. So even though we're gonna need oil, no one's saying oil is gonna go away. We're probably gonna need it for laptops and other things, but we won't need it in the same level. And um, that's a big statement actually to, to see uh, the Middle East, they're gonna be hosting COP. Um, they're gonna be hosting COP. So, you know, they're, they're definitely thinking about it. I think that uh, all the oil companies and all, they're all thinking about how do we become cleaner, greener, and, and hydrogen is a way for them to stay in the game. I think that's, um, you know, a good way for them to do storage. To, you can burn hydrogen. Hydrogen is the smallest element on the periodic chart. So it's uh, in, its, um, in its gaseous form, you can burn it, right? Because you can also liquefy it. But um, we'll talk about hydrogen a little bit later. And these are just simulations of our technology. It can get up to uh, 700 suns. We used a company uh, called Trace Pro, and they did a lot of three-dimensional imaging of the heat that's generated. Um, and if you go back to this Puerto Rico scenario where there's wind, right? This was tested in uh, sandstorms, but it was tested up to... Uh, um, so when you have a hurricane, the wind is actually, you know, if you have a solar panel, it acts like a sail. It will just blow right over or a parabolic dish captures the and it would just, just go away, right? So because our conical rings have holes in it, the wind can pass through it. So we could just turn it off, wait for the storm to pass, and then we can turn it back on again. So it works in category four hurricanes, right? That's a big deal, right? So you won't destroy, uh, the hurricane or the storm won't destroy the technology that's there to be used when the hurricane comes uh, or the bad weather. All right, I'm gonna go through these a little bit quicker. I'm taking too long. Uh, this shows that we can melt metal. This is for brass so we can get, you can't do that until you can get to certain temperatures. And that's what we're trying to show here that we can get up to uh, 1200 degrees uh, Celsius, um, which is hard, high enough to melt metal, right? Which can be a big deal, uh, aluminum, right? So aluminum cans and things like this can be reprocessed and done in a clean way. So the other thing is with the, some of the power towers, you know, they, they shine the light up 
in the sky. And then if you're a bird, you know, that could be, you can, if you fly through the flux, it can be really damaging to birds. So what, what this picture is just showing you is that our tech is clean, it's sustainable, and it doesn't kill animals. And if, even if there was a problem, there's going to be no environmental damage or anything like that. We really did think hard about that. Um, this is just a, an example of how we would co-locate. This is a particular plant in Arizona, a coal fire power plant. I think that's it. And I, there's one more thing I'd like to show you um, is this video of the, of the technology actually melting aluminum in real time. Now you may say, why, why show us this? Well, it actually is a real video because a lot of times, you know, when people talk about what they can do, they can't really show you it. And this is gonna show you in, a mat in real time, in a matter of seconds, the level of heat that we can get to, to melt steel, brass, aluminum. And I think this is where the metal meets the road. We've been tested by um, a company called TUV, TUV in, uh, in Germany. It's just like Enron and they are, you know, giving us the, the green light and the green thumb. So I think, Wendy, I think that's a good start for us to kind of talk about other things around uh, concentrated solar power. Uh, the future of it in this country. And uh, I'd like to hand it back to you for questions. Thank you so much, Steve. Um, really appreciated that overview of CSP. Uh, so I wanted to start off the questions, um, just backing up a little bit. Can you tell us a little bit more about the origin of We Solar? And uh, for instance, where, where does that name come from? Yeah, good question. Um, it's really simple. Uh, 2017, maybe 2018, 2017, uh, a bunch of us has got into a room. We're based in Princeton, New Jersey. We went to the, actually the Princeton Library. I remember that vividly like it was yesterday. And we played the name game and we came up with a bunch of different names. And uh, the one that stuck was We Solar CSP. We Solar initially. Um, and that has a play on um, WeChat. You know, there's a Chinese company called Tencent that owns WeChat. And I think at the time, you know, we just said, oh, that's cool, you know, and it wasn't taken. The name wasn't taken. So we, we, um, we took that name. And also the design of the logo is a, a universal symbol for the sun in all regions of the world. So that, that's the other, we, the person who designed it, she actually designs, she does manga art and stuff like this and she's really cool she, so she came up with a bunch of designs and we ended up with that one that's the logo as well yeah yeah i know in chinese that's the that's the symbol for sun yeah that's cool um so you were talking a little bit um about some of the advantages that your system has uh compared to heliostats for example with the 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 lights and the birds um we did have a question come in from the audience about can you contrast it to pv uh you were you were talking about pv quite a bit but uh what are some of the pros and cons when you compare csp versus pv yeah well okay so i'll start by saying really quickly that pv works it's been it's future proof if you know that term that means it actually has been proven to work and, you know, the production of PV, most of it is from Asia, whether it be Taiwan, China, and places like that. Uh, so the panels are very affordable and they work. And I think there's some really cool technologies that are coming out where they can make it look like glass. Now that's not, in, not always in China, but um, you can, you can make a greenhouse that can produce electricity or regular windows that produce electricity. That's some of the tech that's coming out. That's really hard to do with CSP. <clears throat> so those are the advantages of um, photovoltaics. If you, you know, the disadvantages I would say are that photovoltaics can't do what CSP can do, right? So one, it takes up more space for our technology, not CSP in general, but for our technology, it takes up more space. Space is a big deal, right? You know, if you need 20 acres just to get, you know, whatever, five megawatts, that's a lot of space. So we do it for one third the amount of space. 
And depending on the storage, you know, it may take a little bit more space, but that's that's basically one of the more the disadvantages when you compare our technology to PV. Um, the other really clear disadvantage that you should really think about this idea is photovoltaic panels don't work at night. They're called solar panels, not lunar panels, <laughs> right? They don't work at night. You know, they, they're, they're great during the day, but they don't work at night. So how, does, how, how do you, you know, how do you use it at night when you need the electricity? How do you use it? Well, you need a battery, right? The batteries are expensive. There's different types of batteries, but most of it, most of the batteries are in our cell phones that you can see here, they're in our watches, they're in the Teslas. And actually the battery in the Tesla is brilliant, right? It deserves a Nobel Peace Prize, the battery, by the way. But it, it's brilliant stuff, right? Um, but the, the problem with the battery is that it's expensive. And then if you think about lithium, I, I think maybe some of you may know this, lithium ion is so extracted in Chile, most of it, Chile, almost Australia, like 70% of it, extracted out of the ground in those countries, but it has to be refined in China. And then you've got cobalt, which you need to keep the battery stable. That's most of that is extracted out of um, the Congo, 65% of it in the Congo, cobalt. But it, it, you can't use it. It has to be refined and that, ref that gets refined in China, right? Uh, and then you've got other things like cob uh, copper and nickel and all that kind of stuff. Most of that's from Southeast Asia, right? You extract it in those countries, but then you have to refine it in China, right? And then you need rare earth minerals extracted in uh, China and processed and refined in China. So there's a little bit of an issue around lithium ion, you know, given the policies that we have to move EVs, you know, move everyone to EVs and electrify everything. You know, the batteries are, you know, the raw materials could be a problem. I think there's a lot of people looking at that right now. Um, just to, to, to finish the story, I think that there's a lot of companies out there. And, and to leave this idea with, with your audience is the biggest deposit of lithium ion is in old laptops, old phones and, you know, batteries that are laying around the place. I think that there's companies who are looking to collect those and then actually refine those batteries. So I think that, um, exactly, exactly. So this, that's exactly re re recycling and they're collecting them and they can strip it apart and take out the lithium. And I think that's probably the, in the short term, there are companies like Lifecycle, if you've ever heard of this company, there's another one. Uh, there's a couple of companies out there that do that. So that's the biggest, the biggest differences between CSP and PV and CSP does um, long duration storage, right? We don't need batteries. So long duration energy storage, it does industrial process heat, which is gonna be a big sector of the economy. If you think about electricity production, that's 20, that's 25% of the pie, 25. And Bill Gates talked about this, 75% of Everything that has to be decarbonized is actually from industry, industry, right? So like I said, glass, steel, cement, plastics, all that stuff is made through heat. And so, so those are the things that CSP can do that photovoltaic panels can do. And also water desalination, which I think is the next pandemic. Great, wow. A lot to think about. Uh, so people in the audience are getting really excited about uh, hearing your talk on CSP, and they're they're getting interested in kind of what are the limits of of the design here. So we have several questions. One question is, what if you wanted to do this in more of an urban environment? Could you design a smaller version of this? How small would it make sense to do, and how much energy you know could you get out of a small one? Yeah. So the so the smallest right now is a ten meter cone. Uh, and we can just do one, right? One of them produces up to 250 kilowatts. So if you think about a big house, right? Over a whole year, it could probably get to 100, 150 kilowatts of electricity that that home actually uses. 
So I would say maybe not for a home, but you could do it. You had a big home, but maybe a small factory, a small plant, a small farm. Okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, and um, again, the idea is to become independent of the grid because, you know, some of these, and it could be even for oil, but we'll talk about that in a minute. A lot of these companies or small companies, it could be a tin fac factory. They make tin and all this other stuff. They're not close to the grid, right? The grid has to come out to where they are. Or sometimes they're not even that close and they're using diesel generators and things to get electricity. Farms are off the grid, right? So you can actually do this and have like a, a small solar microgrid. That's outside the city. We're talking, we've actually signed two deals with two cities where we're going to be right inside the city. So absolutely. And um, there, one of the cities is actually thinking about doing uh, a corporate solar corporate sort of grid, you know. So they have a lot. They have a corporate farm, a bunch of companies. I won't mention the names, but they're all in this sort of corporate sort of industrial park, right? Those companies they want to reduce their carbon footprint. How are we getting electricity just to store stuff or distribute stuff? So we can locate inside that corporate park our solar and you know what it does it attracts companies to those parks because they can say oh we can get our electricity clean sustainable and without doing a virtual power plant or something like this we'll be right there um, so that's something that we we definitely uh, looked at so in the city environment that's what I was talking about before when I showed the the cluster because we're one third the amount of size as it would be for um, a solar farm, which is what everyone's doing in America, right? They're all doing solar farms or on the rooftop of the building. And then what I'm trying to say is there's an alternative to that. It doesn't, you're not stuck in that one thing. Right. Uh, so here we have a question about, speaking of solar roofs, yeah, people are used to thinking of the, the horizontal space. So they, they think of rooftops. Is there some way that you could apply CSP on a roof or does it have to be ground mounted? Yeah. Um, again, um, my answer to that is yes, it could go on a roof, but then, you know, it's about 20 meters high, right? So do you really want to have that on the roof, the zoning laws? You know, I think the, the biggest win would be to uh, maybe co-locate if you have the land. And I think that we've done a lot of analysis around that. Again, that's where, you know, if you think about things that makes this an interesting technology, is the land usage, the, the, the lower amount of land usage than you would use for a solar farm, right? Um, and I think that's a big deal, right? So if you're, if you're not, if you're using too much land, um, then you can't fit it into a, an urban environment, right? So we, you know, we don't, again, you cannot have CSP in an urban, like the way CSP is done today, hundreds of megawatts. It takes up swaths of land. If you look at the Ivan Park, it's, you know, hundreds of acres, right, of land. That's what it needs. We're talking about half an acre, right? Not a lot of land. And I think you have that in the, um, you have that in cities that's available to, to use. And I, I also would say, Another thing that we like, just to kind of get it out there, is that we do like warmer environments. But we just signed an LOI with a university that is not in a warm environment. And we're going to be doing some research. We're looking to do research uh, around CSP in, you know, maybe not the warmest part of the world uh, that we can, um, you know, because when you look at the war in Ukraine and you look at the price of gas that's going up, now if you do CSP in maybe not the highest, warmest part of the world, the prices may be a little bit higher, but boy, guess what? It's less than the price of gas and it's clean, green and sustainable. So those are, those are ideas. We're talking to the national labs about this. Um, you know, they think it makes sense. So, you know, they're, they're the smartest guys in the room. Great. Um, shifting gears a little bit, I was curious if you could offer some 
advice uh, for people looking in to get into a green career, uh, such as renewables and renewable energy? What kind of advice do you have for young people today who are, who are thinking about these issues? Yeah, so, you know, when I went to college, I, I majored in finance, business. Uh, that's why I was, you know, not told to do it, but that was where, you know, back then, that's, those are the, the, the great careers, right? Um, today, uh, absolutely no, right? Um, I was like, I think I mentioned to you that I was on, I watched a podcast uh, last week when I was in Seattle. It was out of Stanford Graduate School. These are the smartest guys, you know, they're really smart. And that's what we see. We see all, like every conversation I have with younger students or people in college or in high school that they want to, they really want to do something, but they don't know what to do, right? So this is what I suggest is major in environmental science, major in chemical or environmental engineering, right? This, so if you look at this new law that was passed, the, the IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act, you know, there's about $400 billion there just for this country to do this work that we have to do, which will have an impact. It's not just about money, right? So you're going to be able to have an impact on your communities, your grandparents, your grandkids, if you have them. You know, we all have kids. It's not about red or blue or politics. It's about doing something, you know, good that's, you know, we, we enjoyed the air and all the good things of nature. So we should leave that for someone else. I think that those are the careers where you can make a lot of money and do a lot of good things. Um, and if you want to work for We Solve CSP, feel free to, to come. Or if you want to just learn more about, you know, this, this area that is, you know, some of it is quite technical and can be very hard. But one of the things that I would say is engineering is not a bad place to start. So material science engineering, because we get to high temperatures, but you need to hold the uh, temperature, hold that in a material that can hold it, right? So material science engineering is a really big deal, chemical engineering, um, industrial engineering. So those are good fields, they have STEM fields, and I think for minorities as well, that there's, there's not enough of that. Us, me, I'm a minority, so. Um, and, you know, I, I just think the you know, this is part of my mission, right? Not just to make money, right? It's about, you know, looking back and, 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 lifting, and lifting someone up. If your dream, I have a saying here, if your dreams don't scare you, then they're not big enough. <laughs> so that's what I would think, you know, just for younger kids, you know, dream big. Don't, don't be scared. Don't, don't, uh, be shy, you know, just go for it and you'll be, you'll be surprised where you, where you end up. That's awesome. Uh, so Steve, you mentioned that you're looking forward to COP in December being in the, the Middle East. Uh, what other kinds of goals are you looking forward to in the next, say, three to five years for, for this? Right. So... <sighs> I'm not at liberty to talk about some of the deals that we're talk, working on right now, but the scope is incredible, right? We're, I mean, it was hard. I'm gonna tell you the, the story. It wasn't easy to get to this point where I'm sitting here talking to you. I mean, it's been, you know, pandemics, um, you know, bootstrapping, you know, not being able to get the funding that I, you know, there's a guy, a good friend of mine, actually, his name's Don out there, you probably know him. He says something like, I asked 200 times, I got 200 no's, right? So it's not easy. You have to have very thick skin and you have to have a passion and a desire to be an entrepreneur. It's not, the yeah, so this, in two weeks, I'm going to uh, Dubai. I'm going to UAE with the Department of Commerce. Um, you know, they're, they're bringing companies over. We have, a, we have a demonstration plant there in that country. So yeah, the conversations I'm having now and the companies that I'm speaking to at the highest levels, you know, you, you stick with something, you actually start to become a thought leader. So um, yeah, th that's it. That's all I have to say about, um, you asked me about becoming an entrepreneur, right? Is that what you asked me? I'm not sure. Oh, I was just asking whether you had any 
goals for the next three to five years and and it's fine if you can't talk about specifics but in, in oh general... yeah let me finish let me finish then sorry so goals would be um you know we're having conversations with um very large global companies around um projects that involve district heating uh and if you don't know what district heating is is where you have underground pipes that provide heat it could be for the army it could be for big hotel chains that that need heat, right? Heat and cooling. And right now they burn a fossil fuel to get there and we can actually do it uh, in a cleaner, and this is the whole concept of hybridization, right? So we push our clean steam into their fossil fuel process and it reduces the amount of demand for that fossil fuel. You know, Again, we're always talking about decarbonization. How do you decarbonize, right? It's a, it's a cool, flippant word that people throw out there all the time, but how do you actually do it? And even how do you actually measure it, right? So it, it becomes very complicated. I just want to say one thing about that. Uh, last week I was in a conference in Seattle and the, you know we, we were able to pull together some of the top companies, I won't mention names, but just billions of dollars in one room of energy buyers, procurers and energy providers clean energy providers right so you know once you can do those kind of things you can actually start to see a pathway to you know what kind of projects you'll have in the future uh we signed a uh, like i said an loi with a university um recently to do research um and um we have two two pro two projects in the, the us that we with cities and you know when you sign with a city that's a big deal uh, and then we have uh, some other initiatives that are going on in the Caribbean and places like that and, and uh, the UAE. Great. Well, thank you so much. We really appreciate we appreciate you spending your time with us and telling us more about your story. Um, and yes, if you do have other uh, papers or articles that you'd like me to share, I will be happy to do that. Yeah, absolutely. I'll, sh I'll share it in the chat. Uh, actually, probably just share it to you, and then um, I'll, you know, we can get it out to everyone who who dialed into the call. But yeah, right. I have a, a, my my co-founder wrote a, um, a white paper on green hydrogen, and I think that it's currently up to twenty four thousand views. Um, and yeah, we're going to be working with a lot of companies on how. So the concept here, if you're really interested, is how we can do green hydrogen cheaper than blue hydrogen. Blue is when you sequester the carbon and green is where you use solar panels and batteries and other things to produce electricity. So there's a lot of debate between is blue hydrogen where you make it in the dirty way, you just capture the carbon, carbon capture, as opposed to the green hydrogen, which is cleaner, but a little bit more expensive today. So I'll put that in the chat to you, uh, to you, Wendy, you can share it. Great. Well, thank, thank you. And by the way, thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you for working <laughs> with me. Because honestly, I was all over the place the last couple of weeks and uh, very busy. And you were so good in getting the word out. Um, there was a lot of people that signed up for this uh, event. And I just want to say thanks for Actera and giving me the platform to to speak about this and you know and i'll be a big supporter of yours you know in any way that i can awesome well thank you very much to everyone and thank you steve and uh we'll look forward to seeing everyone at another future event thanks and take care thank you very much